from the digital divide to the COVID pandemic to the challenges we face in pharmaceuticals, pharmaceutical shortages, by the way, not just in developing countries, but right here at home in the United States, one of the most developed countries in the history of the world. Uh, Jeffrey Ling, you'll remember from two years ago, joined us at Twin Global 2018 and blew us all away. Uh, Jeffrey is not a professional speaker who's on the circuit. Jeffrey is just a guy with preternatural energy and mission and purpose great stories and, and a funny turn of phrase to boot. Um, he's a physician at Johns Hopkins. He's a retired colonel uh, with the US Army, a medical doctor, a researcher, and on the front lines, not only in Iraq and Afghanistan for five or six tours of duty, but also in the current pandemic. He talked about really two sort of meta stories. One was seeing young people and people of all ages who had been horribly injured in conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan, seeing them losing their limbs, for instance. And back in 2005, remember that was 15 years ago. In 2005, he had an idea and a few others were talking about it, but most people thought it was crazy because by the way, it was crazy. And the idea was, if someone has lost their, their arm, why don't we give them a new arm and connect it directly to the brain? So a brain, direct brain connected prosthetic. He explained the concept back in 2005. People thought he was nuts, but fortunately for us, for all of us, he took a role at DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And DARPA uh, is the tip of the spear for American technology development. And he was able to, with DARPA, muster resources to do a program to develop a prosthetic arm connected directly to the brain, which works today, which is being used by people today, right now as we speak. And the really brilliant thing that, one of the brilliant things he shared was, look, if you think about it, everybody said it was impossible, but if you think about it, all you really need are, is neuroscience and some engineers. And I think by your quote, Jeffrey, that I always remember is, uh, neuroscience, you need an engineer, and you slap them together, and that's it. And then you say to yourself, oh my gosh, it's so easy. And of course we all laughed because it's not so easy, but you expressed what I refer to as brutal simplicity. Jeffrey, you took an, an absolutely impossible concept and said, look, if we distill it down to its basics, here's what we really need. And it worked. So Jeffrey Ling, welcome back to Twin. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back here, Rob. Great. Well, so where are you right now through this pandemic? So um, presently, I'm in, believe it or not, Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, ah, very what, nice. Ne well, not so. Um, I'm actually, oh. for, the, for our friends on the air, um, I had to come out to take care of my mother-in-law. But um, as the state quarantine has it, um, I am confined to her house for 14 straight days with my mother-in-law and her two dogs. So I, I bring it to you. Uh, how much of a vacation in Hawaii is it if you're confined to a house alone with your mother-in-law and two dogs for two weeks. <laughs> but, well, but she's doing well. I, I am not she's going to well. touch that. <laughs> <laughs> she's doing well, thank you. But I am calling you from you right now from Honolulu, Hawaii. But um, That's great. as far as the pandemic goes, is I was, of course, in Baltimore. I am an, a critical care physician, which means I run ICUs. So for uh, certainly in the springtime, I was um, in the ICU at Johns Hopkins, where I am, uh, taking care of COVID right. patients. And um uh, subsequently, of course, we're in a, in Maryland, at least, we're in a bit of a lull. Uh, the numbers have gone down for hospitalizations, but as everybody knows on the air here, that it, they're going back up again. It is the fall surge. Yeah. It is happening. Uh, right. We should all expect it. And hopefully it will not have the tragic death rate that the uh, uh, spring uh, event had. But we have hit 200,000 people. We have a disease right now that's on our shores. I like to call it an enemy because, as you know, I had a military background and we have an yeah. enemy that 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 stormed ashore on our shores. We're caught completely by surprise, completely by surprise. At the time, we had no diagnostic, no therapeutic, no prophylactic. And um, and so uh, and no vaccine. And so where are we today? Uh, right now, we have no FDA approved diagnostic. We have no therapeutic. We have no vaccine. And we have no prophylactic. So we really are, things are no different now than they were, other than the fact that we do know that social distancing and masks help, 
But quite frankly, that's all we have. So we are still in the midst of fighting this horrible enemy. And I want to remind all of our viewers that uh, do not take it lightly. It, uh, you know, uh, from you don't see it, um, you know, back in the Middle Ages, of course, there were bodies in the street, right, for, for the bubonic plague. And of course, during the 1917-18 uh, Spanish influenza pa uh, pandemic, uh, there were right. there were bodies in the street. And fortunately, there are no bodies in the street. But make no mistake, 200,000 Americans have died. And uh, and I've been witness to that. And it's not a not a way you want to pass. So it is a serious, well, serious Jeffrey, problem. So we're we're following this and and like in yeah. any combat uh, or 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 war we end up seeing it in the news every day we can become a little bit desensitized to the magnitude of the numbers and i also we also don't want to go too far the other direction and become despondent because of the numbers but what is one thing about navigating through the pandemic that i you think that citizens should know that maybe people don't appreciate enough one thing that we should know that we don't appreciate enough about navigating the pandemic. Sure. Number one is um, the preventive measures that Dr. Fauci speaks of, they actually do work. When we wear a mask, we're actually protecting the other person. So this is really a situation where are you your, um, are, are, how good of a, a fellow citizen are you? Because when you wear a mask, you actually protect the other person. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting. If you're wearing a a respirator, of course, you're protecting yourself and the other person. But number one, the mask is preventing your droplets from being uh, highly right. infective. And so you're protecting the other person. I think that's a really important point to make. This is one of those situations where the things that the measures you do are helping others. Yeah. And, and it's something that it's actually quite easy to do. It's mildly annoying sometimes. But if we're talking about this kind of impact, it's, it's really quite easy to do. So how is your military experience affected the way you approach engaging with this pandemic and your and you've been on the front lines here as an ICU uh, physician. Yeah, no, I uh, thank you. Yes, so I served in Iraq, I served in Afghanistan. So it is the same and it's a bit different. It's a bit different in the sense that um uh it's it's a virus now rather than than gross trauma, but it's the same in the sense that the the danger for a provider is the same as the danger for a patient, right? Uh, what I find that's remarkable about this is a lot of my colleagues who are uh, civilians, they're now seeing what it's like to work in a truly a wartime environment. Many, many patients, they're all coming in. The system is getting close to being overwhelmed. As you know, New York City came very, very close to running out of ICU beds. Um, these are these are facts uh, that happen during crises, and wartime is a crisis. And of course, there's the yeah. danger to the provider, right? But at the same time, um, it's always focused on the patient, the patient, the patient. Right. The patient first, the patient first, the patient first. Um, and what you do is what's wonderful is you see a lot of these uh, folks that are uh, the nurses, the respiratory therapists, even the housekeepers in a hospital. They're all unsung heroes and they go to work and they do the job in spite of the tremendous danger to themselves. Uh, it's very much yeah. like a wartime environment. It's 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 yeah. it's a wonderful thing. I mean, people do care about other people, but it, it's, it's gratifying. <laughs> it gives you hope on mankind. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it really does. And it also, sh people show their true colors through these kinds of situations as well. Um, so let's shift to the soda machine that you told us about at Twin Global 2018 to, to remind people who are with us, or if you haven't seen, if you have not seen Jeffrey Ling's video from Twin Global 2018, uh, after Twin Tech 2020 is over, go to that video, watch the video, bring your kids into the living room, uh, skip the, the Netflix for just, just 20 minutes. Uh, Jeffrey shared this idea that he had to produce pharmaceuticals on demand wherever and whenever needed, and the darn thing works. I mean, it, it's, it's a mind-blowingly simple solution to an excruciatingly big challenge. So Jeffrey, tell us a little bit about on-demand pharmaceuticals and what you guys are up to, how that's developed in the past two years. Well, in fact, uh, Rob, it's uh, accelerated dramatically in the last six months, largely because of the some of the vulnerabilities that have been uh, shown because of this pandemic. So uh, to bring us back, um, when I was in Afghanistan way back when, um, I ran out of a drug. It was a drug called bromocryptine. And I needed it for a young wounded soldier because he had suffered a pretty severe injury and I needed to stabilize his blood pressure and his heart rate so that he could get on an, uh, on an airplane and be airlifted to Germany for definitive care. So, um, and I've, 
you, as you would imagine, in the entire country of Afghanistan, I could not find any bromocryptine. I mean, there just isn't any. <clears throat> this is an old generic drug. We didn't have it because it's not a, a, a typical medicine. But uh, to long story short, I needed it to stabilize this young soldier. So the Air Force flew it to me. And when the Air Force flew it to me, um, you know, I often thought to my head, oh, my goodness gracious, this box of bromocryptine probably cost like 300 gazillion dollars just in jet fuel alone. But right. <laughs> needless to say, I had it. I gave it to the young soldier and sent him out, but gave me an idea. And that idea was, is, hmm, um, if you think about it, bromocrypt is an old drug. You know, my PhD is in medicinal chemistry. And if I had a chemistry set, I could sort of make it myself. And so that born the idea of an automatic chemistry set. And when you step back again and you say, bromocryptine, hmm, how unusual of a drug is it from a composition of status? It's not that unusual. It's made, it's an organic compound. It's made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Hmm, ibuprofen, same thing. So, uh, body, same thing. Moving, thank you, same thing. All my carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, what they call organic compounds. So it means is, if I had a good chemistry set, a really good chemistry set, and I had a pencil, I had a glass of water and an egg, I could make anything, right? Because they all have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in it. So we're not quite at a pencil, a glass of water, and an egg. But the concept you understand is that you can start with very few starting materials. So you can make a whole bunch of stuff if you had a really, really good chemistry set. So the problem distills down to just two things, chemistry and an automatic chemistry set, engineering and chemistry. And if I lump the two together, I should have this capability. Oh That's my gosh, it. it's so easy. Oh my That's gosh, it. it's so easy. Right, so get some <laughs> smart chemical engineers and some smart chemists and lump them together. And we did. So we went to some friends of mine, uh, Klaus Jensen, uh, Tim Jameson, and Alan Meyerson. Uh, they're very smart chemical engineers and chemists. They just happen to be professors at MIT. And uh, we sat down and we mapped this out. And in fact, we built the machine. And we started showing the chemistry. So right now, the machine is about the size of a household refrigerator, and it will make 16 different medicines. And so um, it works. Uh, and the neat thing about it is that because of its size, you can use elements of chemistry, heat, uh, heat and uh, pressure to speed rates of reaction. Because of its uh, size, you and because you can use speed up, sped up, rates of reaction, you can add more steps. And why is that right. important? Because if you add more steps, you go further and further back, closer to my egg, my pencil, and my glass of water. And it's relevant to this discussion because unlike other processes, our machine, which is unusual, was, was enjoyed by the military, our military, because our military doesn't want to be dependent upon foreign countries for right. anything. And, so, and most of our generic drugs are made overseas, and that's a security risk for all of us. Right. And, and more, to, more to that story, Rob, is not only are our active pharmaceutical ingredients, the magic substance and pills and such, made overseas, but the starting materials are made overseas. So when you hear make API in the United States, the hidden secret is you still got a source from overseas, the starting material. So well, just we so I understand, we understand this story, Jeffrey. Yeah. You're saying the more we can instantiate, the more we can put those processes, those reactions into this refrigerator, the further back in the food chain we can get in terms of the inputs necessary. The closer we get to the pencil and the egg, the more released we are from risk because we can produce what we need to produce wherever it needs to be. And by the way, that could be in America or that could be in a war zone, or that could be in another country. It could be in a developing country where they don't have access to generic drugs easily, and now we could give that access. So bring us to today. What's going on with on-demand pharmaceuticals? What's next for on-demand pharmaceuticals? So on-demand pharmaceuticals has its device. Uh, on-demand pharmaceuticals is expanding the uh, menu of different medications we can make. And right now we're zeroed in on making those medicines that are necessary to take care of patients in the ICU because we ran dangerously close to running out of them in the spring. So we're ramped up to make them now. And these are medicines that are sedatives. These are medicines that are paralytics. These are medicines that are painkillers because that's what you need. In and an this ICU. is all approved by the FDA to actually use 
and to be used for a civilian. Correct. Medicine. Correct. Wow. This is now being ramped up for civilians. And the idea is, is that, again, we use domestically sourced raw materials, turn them into what I would call starting materials to turn them into the AP uh, active pharmaceutical green, and then turn them into the final product. This is very important. You don't take an API. You take a final product. So you want to take your pill. You want to have a solution that doctor put a syringe inject into you. So this goes from A through Z. And uh, in the size of a refrigerator, and, and on demand is doing it right now as we speak. We can do it uh, end to end. Uh, you know, if you actually came to Rockville, Maryland, I could show you. We could push a button and make some some antibiotic for you. But um, wow. the the reality is is that we have to scale up because um, again, we the idea of being sure that we ensure our country's supply of medicines is there, and that's and these are all critical elements. There are other benefits to this as well quality and the like, but, but you get the point. Oh. Well, this is extraordinary. We're coming down to the, to the end of this conversation, at least. I know there'll be many more between us, but uh, you're a great storyteller, Jeffrey. What's one story, not too long, uh, one story from your heritage, your history, your, your life experience that tells us something about how we build better futures? A story that tells us something about how each of us can be involved in building better futures. So I'm going to uh, tell you a story about my mother. So my mom, right. Helen Ling, uh, recently passed away. Sad, but it was she lived a good life. So I remember her that, uh, and this is relevant. She said to me, um, when you think about it, always know where your place is and your contribution into the grand scheme of the future. So in 1957, when she came out of school, she joined the U.S. space program as an engineer. So she's an Asian American woman, educated at Hunter College in New York City, came out with a math degree, and who hired her was Martin Marietta, and they were starting to build, at the time, the Vanguard rocket. And the Vanguard rocket gave rise, ultimately, to um, uh, the, uh, the, the Apollo missions of uh, spacecraft, all right? So she was already working um, on the U.S. space program, Asian American woman, in 1957. Wow. So, but she remembered clearly, in 1963, President Kennedy's remark, we are going to go to the moon by the end of the decade. That was perhaps the boldest thing that many of us heard in our lifetimes. And so she, as an engineer, had just, re had just come off the launch pad where Vanguard had blown up on the launch pad, exploded, they they never, never lifted. And she's going, good gracious, the president is, is making this challenge. But when she stepped back, it, it was a galvanizing moment. Because everybody in the room, everybody around, knew that what the president demanded of them and knew the contribution, that even though they weren't going to build the rocket themselves, they knew that they had to succeed in this element of it, this piece of it, so that the other pieces, that the other people were going to succeed at, and the totality right. would come together, and we would go to the moon and come back. And a lot of people poo-poo that space mission, but they have no idea what they're talking about, because we hadn't even gone into space yet. And even better, you the whole idea is you're going to bring a man and put him on the moon and bring him back alive. That is not an insignificant thing to do, even today. So it was a remarkable moment. But as you saw, we succeeded, didn't we? We succeeded. We did it in seven years by the end of the decade. And that was a remarkable thing. I mean, when you think about what it took, but what it meant that humankind can do when they come together. But everybody has to know their part. And they have to be hold responsibility that they will succeed because their part is important. It may be a screw. Right. It may be an O-ring, right, from right. Challenger. Yes. But it Challenger. needs to succeed so that everybody else's contribution and the totality changes the world in a meaningful way. Jeffrey, your story about your mother tells us a lot about why you are the way you are. Imagine that uh, a, an Asian American woman in 1957 being uh, hired to be involved in a rocket program. We don't hear, we haven't heard those stories until just relatively recently. And it's a great thing that we have, but even more extraordinary to me about her words to you is, understand your place in the grand scheme of the world and, and really of history. How f rarely do, does each of us stand back and think? Maybe it feels megalomaniacal, but I don't think that it is if you do it with honesty and humility 
and love. How do you fit within this grand scheme of the world? Um, Jeffrey, you certainly do fit within this grand scheme of the world. Uh, it has been great to see people caring for each other. No one does it more than you. And you do it with creativity, energy, optimism that's infectious, and sometimes, honestly, even a little exhausting. But we're glad you're on the front lines. And thanks again for being with us at TWIN. You're going to join us for an in the room session a, a little bit later on this morning, uh, along with a whole bunch of our other Twinians. Jeffrey Ling, thank you again so much for your service and for being with us at TWIN. Thank you.